Hello, welcome to the Romantic Period Overview uh, in BritLit. So I am going to uh, share my screen so you can still see me. I have no idea why you had the two faces of me, right? Um, so I've used the Norton int uh, uh, introduction that you had in there, but I've added some uh, extra comments so that um, you know, as I make some extemporaneous things, most of the things I'm going to talk about that are not in that period interview I've added here. And so that's been updated. So our first period of in Survey of British Lit II is the Romantic Era. And as your book says, it is one of the shortest uh, of all literary era, eras. It's also unusual in that it's named after a literary genre as opposed to a monarch or kind of a philosophical concept of the time or even the ending and closing dates of the century. Uh, so it's quite unique that way. But it by no means is less complicated, less influential than other periods in spite of its shortness. In fact, I think it's one of the most continual, uh, continually influential periods. Um, the Romantics just did some things so different. They, they said things, they, they, they um, started talking about poetry and literature in such a different way. And that still influences us today. And we still argue about many of those concepts. So I'll, I'll pick out a few in the interview, but as, or the introduction, but as we go and start reading things like Lyrical Ballads by Wordsworth and Coleridge and Defense of Poetry by, uh, by Shelley, um, I will come back to some of these concepts in more depth. So uh, as you can see on the screen here, um, the actual word romance is not used in the way we think of modern romances. That's just about a, a, some kind of uh, intimate relationship between two people. Um, the word romance comes from Latin, uh, a word that refers to the use of the vulgar or the vernacular language as opposed to Latin to write in. And so romances are just narrative stories that were written in common language. Right. And they usually involved stories of, of like King Arthur and his knights, right? Chivalry, quest, mysterious adventures, oftentimes fantastical and supernatural elements. Um, there oftentimes was a love aspect, but usually it was some kind of either idealized love where he's loving her from afar, but they can't really actually be together. Or it might be some person, some woman or something trying to seduce the knight away from his quest or something like that, right? These are primarily uh, written in the 12th to 16th century in Europe, and they could be in poetry or in prose, right? So we have, um, you know, a variety, but they were the most popular form, uh, primarily coming from the ar aristocratic courts um, of the time. Uh, and oftentimes influenced by women, uh, ironically. Um, the court of chivalry was really something created by Catherine, um, Eleanor of Aquitaine and her daughter, um, and kind of these principles spread throughout. Um, and so in the Romantic period, authors are looking back at these medieval romances, and they're kind of saying, you know what, these have never been given the appreciation that they deserve. And they really liked the, the fantastical and chivalrous and, you know, kind of visionary aspect of many of these quest stories. And so we see them bringing them back and doing their own versions. Um, this is oftentimes in response to the era right before, which was the neoclassical age. And the neoclassical age is it's split into three different periods, but overall, um, it was an era that harkened back to Roman and Greek principles. And I've got a little definition here for you from the Victorian web page. It says, neoclassical literature embodied a group of attitudes toward art and human existence, ideals of order, logic, restraint, accuracy, correctness, restraint, decorum, and so on. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and again, the, the, the purpose was to imitate or reproduce classical Greek and Roman uh, themes and structures and stuff like that, right? So whereas in, in that case, rules were everything. 
right? Uh, satire and prose. I mean, there were lots of poetry being written, but it was in a very restrained, rule-driven manner. With the Romantics, we see an embracing of the impulsive, the spontaneous, right? That you just throw yourself in there and you throw out the rule book, right? And that's why in the Romantic era, though we certainly see genre and we certainly see an embracing of the lyric, which is usually a short poem, traditionally in the classical sense written to be uh, performed with music. That's why today our so popular songs have lyrics, right? Um, the, the lyric doesn't have any set form, right? There's no set rhyme scheme or meter. So though we do see uh, a lot of poets writing sonnets, we're not going to see um, any of these real traditional forms that have specific rhyme, meter, length, and that kind of stuff. Um, these guys just kind of, I mean, they're kind of really, um, I'm not saying that they invented free verse, but they're very much the first uh, era where I think we see a, a real adherence to that. Let's just do whatever feels right, right? Um, your book also talks about trying to identify kind of a starting and stopping period. And of course, all of these are very gray areas because you know, our first poets that we're going to look at, Blake and Burns, are actually usually called pre-romantics. They're not really part of the romantic movement um, in, in, in more formal terms, but we definitely see some of these romantic notions precursed in their writings. And so there's always, you know, this little lovely gap between the old ideas and when the new ideas are really kind of firmly established and articulated. So trying to find that starting and stopping point is just always, you know, a kind of a fool's game. But there are a couple of dates that we can look at. Definitely one of the things that really sparked um, an interest in more of a free thinking, you know, wait, let's improve society kind of stuff were the revolutions in America and France. And so some people want to say that the Romantic movement really starts in 1776 with the American Revolution, or at least 1783 when we signed the Treaty of Paris and so Britain had to admit defeat. I mean, this was, you know, a huge thing, right? Other people, and this is what I truly am, am more likely to believe, or, or what I've always you know, adhere to is really the French Revolution, 1789. I think because the French Revolution, it's right there across the channel. It's much more immediate. Now, obviously, the French Revolution was inspired and spurred by the American Revolution. So I think we can see it as a continuity. But I think for a lot of our, 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 our authors, the immediacy of the French Revolution is probably more influential. In terms of ending the, uh, the Romantic period, uh, we usually look at about 1832, and this was when Parliament passed this first major reform act that expanded voting rights down to the middle classes and, and a little bit more the lower classes. Women still do not have the right, the right to vote, and people and slavery is still, is still legal, but uh, we do see expansion of voting rights, and then in the Victorian era, we're going to see other reform bills that even expands voting more, and women eventually get suffrage, and slavery is uh, outlawed. So again, we, that is coming. This is kind of the, the step to it, right? In terms of revolution and reaction, um, England is, you know, going through the Industrial Revolution throughout the 19th century, but we see the precursors at the very end of the 18th century. Uh, and this is great change where agricultural, uh, you know, businesses are being threatened. Um, you know, England is fighting, um, you know, I guess, how many did they fight? I, they really fought three consistent wars during this time period, right? They had the American Revolution from 1776 to 1783. And then the French Revolution started up in 1789. And that lasted quite a while until Napoleon was defeated in 1815. Um, and then in 1812, they were also fighting us in the War of 1812. And they were actually carrying on a two front campaign between us and Napoleon, right? Um, and so that is a huge burden on all aspects of society. First of all, you have, you know, adult men and, you know, you oftentimes young boys to your younger men um, fighting. So they are out of the economy. They're out of their homes. Women and children and elderly are having to do more, right? Um, it also is an incredible ac economic burden because somebody has to pay for those troops to be fighting all of those wars. Um, and in fact, we can even go back to earlier times with the French and Indian War. Um, 
in the 18th century that actually really started um, uh, Britain's problems with money, right? They are the greatest um, military might at the time in the 18th century, and yet, you know, having to pay for all that is quite expensive. Um, and so, uh, part of what happens is that the aristocracy, they, you know, they're seeing their, their uh, profits fading. Uh, and at the time, there were these open areas, right, where people could graze their animals, they could grow a small patch of crops to help sustain them, right, so that you could have these small cottage industries in rural towns. They were kind of like mom and pop stores, or maybe one village would have like one thing that they did, like they wove specific kinds of, of cloth or something like that. They could kind of you know, sustain because they could send those products out, but also people had plenty of land that they could use to, you know, supplement, right, so that they didn't have to worry about always having to buy something. But uh, what we see starting in the late uh, 18th century and, and throughout the 19th century are what we call the Enclosure Acts. And so, you know, same thing happened in America in the 1800s when farmers started and ranchers started putting barbed wire up uh, to, you know, you know, section off their land and all of a sudden you couldn't have these cattle drives just going through, you know, open country, right? The same thing is happening in England. The aristocracy is all of a sudden putting fences around uh, lots of land that used to be available for anyone to, you know, graze their cow or sheep or grow a little bit of, of, of veggies or something like that. And so people no longer have that and they don't have any more income to replace the food and resources lost there. Um, there are also increasing taxation and, and costs of, of uh, you know, foodstuffs, um, you know, things that happen during incredible war times. And so we see a tension. And we also see at this time a rise of industry, right? Uh, we're going to see more and more train tracks being uh, laid down as steam power becomes very important. Um, and so people are flocking to the city because that's where these industrial jobs are because they're not making enough, uh, enough money in their homes or they, um, their, their, their industry is just, you know, dried up because all of a sudden, instead of employing 10 people to weave those cloths, you know, the owner of the factory has bought a, a, a loom that automatically does it. And so he only needs two people, right? We do see the rise of a group of people called Luddites, L-U-D-D-I-T-E-S. These are people who are anti-technology and um, they eventually, you know, some of them would riot, they would go into the factories and they would break the machines, uh, burn them and things like that. Uh, at one point, um, it was penalty of death to do this, right? The aristocracy was tired of losing money. Uh, Lord Byron famously argued um, for some kind of protection for these people and a change in, in the system that was making them so desperate. Um, and I think that with the Luddites, this is just, um, Another way that anarchy was something that became very, very fearful to those in power. And so, again, as we have a lot of the Romantics supporting the revolutionary ideals of France and, and America and, um, and other places around the world, eventually, uh, unlike the American Revolution, the French Revolution just devolved into what they call the Reign of Terror. And if you've any seen, seen a Scarlet Pimpernel movie or something, you know what this is about, right? The guillotine and all that. And the people who used to support um, revolution, they became quite appalled by just how bad things were getting. Uh, and then Napoleon took over and it looked like for maybe a bit that things were going to settle down. But then you know, he becomes this despot, this tyrant, this megalomaniac who decides he's going to conquer the known world, right? He wants to be the new Alexander. And so even he, you know, seemed promising, able to contain the violence, and that disintegrates quite rapidly. And so because of all of this fear that people have about what they're seeing in other parts of the world, um, the idea of revolution and of any significant social change becomes something that's looked on very suspiciously um, by people in England. And this is one of the reasons why we don't see the abolition of slavery happen. We had, at one point, it looked very promising, but then I think there was a, a revolt in Haiti or something like that that ended up being, you know, just a lot of violence. And people were arguing, well, we don't want that to happen here, right? So to make things safe, um, they 
didn't make a lot of social reform. Instead, the government started applying really oppressive strict regulation so people couldn't meet in public anymore um you know that was just one example of things um instead of being censored you were threatened with uh treason or sedition right which is penalized by death so this was another way that they tried to keep um writers from um uh, encouraging people to 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 step up and and complain right uh, and so we're going to see that, and we're going to see in the writing of the time, um, poets actually addressing a lot of these issues, sometimes metaphorically, uh, you know, sometimes not really direct, but especially when we see Blake, we're going to see, I think, a lot of criticism. We get to Wordsworth, we're going to see a lot of criticism of the state of uh, London, especially. And one thing to understand is that in the neoclassical era, right before, the city was where everyone wanted to be in. Right. They, they everybody wanted to be in the city. It was sophisticated. London was the most advanced city in the world. That was where it's at. The country was hell. Right. In the Romantic period, London is overrun. Right. There are all sorts of really cheap uh, living quarters being put up so that to house all of these new employees. Um, there's not enough jobs to go around. So we see increases in prostitution, in child labor, in theft and, and all sorts of things, right? Um, pollution, the dirtiness of it, it's just horrible, right? The conditions are dismal. And so in the romantic era, the idea is that you want to go to the country because the country is natural. It's the way we're supposed to live, not cooped up in these little squalid rooms where we're in the most base conditions, right? Um, that is a common theme that we're going to see here. In the Victorian era, I think we kind of have a swing back a little bit to the idea because Victoria was such um, a unifying figure. But then we get to the end of the Victorian era with Joseph Conrad. We're going to have another author who kind of has this idea that London is hell, right? We're not going to read that particular book where he says that. But again, we see that as with all things, there are movements and counter movements, you know, people react to what came before. Um, this is oftentimes described as a, a nation of two nations where you have the very, very wealthy and the very, very poor, and the gap between them is going to increase in this time, which of course foments a lot of unhappiness and, uh, and, and threatens. And, and instead of making changes that might help make of other people's lives better, the rich just seem to just kind of circle their wagons and hold on even more tightly to their own privileges. And that becomes a problem. Uh, just as a side note, I think it's interesting here that shopping becomes a, a word. It's, we first see this word in English. And again, this idea of being able to buy new things. Um, as the empire grows, they're now importing more things from different parts of the empire. And so it's the idea of being able to buy something that's from another country or whatever. Um, women authors, uh, we still don't have social equality. Rules are pretty bad. When we read Mary Wollstonecraft's Vindication of the Rights of Women, we're going to see, you know, her plea about that and with her backstory, just how difficult it was for women. But they are writing and they actually have more access to writing and in part because of, and we'll talk about this a little bit, uh, difference in productions that make it easier to produce and, and publish. Uh, blue stocking is a term that comes to, becomes to be um, associated with these intellectual women writers, uh, mainly because they oftentimes wore a particular stocking that was dyed blue that for some reason. And so they call it called blue stockings, right? Um, and so with some of our writers, when we see Byron and Shelley and, and Mary Shelley is right there along with them, we do see an acceptance of women writers, but uh, Wordsworth only talks about poets as being men. And one of the interesting things here is that women writers were usually described as being emotional and male writers were described as being intellectual and rational. Um, and so, of course, that worked in the neoclassical era where they're trying to live up to the Greek and Roman standards, which were very rational and logic and all that. And so the lyric, the humble tale of everyday life had always kind of been the domain of the female. And so now these male poets are all of a sudden wanting to say, this is the true domain of the poet. And they're wanting to make this argument that it's a man's domain, but it's a, again, it's a very different way of looking at poets. Um, you know, you wouldn't be writing the kind of things that we see a lot of the romantics writing in the eras before because it just, you know, uh, it would be like only pastorals would be things where we would see people talking about 
the countryside, but now we're seeing people talk about them in plays and stuff. So again, it's really shifting the landscape of what it means to be a poet and all of that, right? So I think we have some, you know, male writers who aren't really willing to acknowledge female writers, but the females are out there and they're writing and they have more access to publishing more than ever. And so we're just going to see that as a continual cycle as more and more women are writing. One of the things I really uh, am disappointed in this book is that we don't have more representations. We don't have any Jane Austen. We don't have any Bronte sisters. We don't have uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. I mean, I can think of so many incredible novels. Uh, Jane Eyre is my my favorite literary novel. There's nothing about Jane Eyre in here. And I just, I just don't know how to explain that because, um, you know, they give us a lot of other females that are okay writers, but some of the, the really big dogs, if you will, of the literary scene, especially in the Victorian era and the late romantic era, there's no representation of them. And, and I think that's an actual, um, uh, negative about this anthology. My personal opinion, right? Uh, so theory and practice, new poetries. Uh, just again, the idea that the romantics didn't call themselves romantics, just as the medieval era didn't call themselves the Dark Ages. This was a, a moniker given to them by the next proceeding. So the Renaissance is the one that called the Dark Ages the Dark Ages. And the Victorians are the ones who call the romantics the romantics, right? Um, again, poetry is the most prominent, uh, important genre uh, that the, and again, that's the romantics believe that, right? That doesn't mean that we don't have other um, things being written, but poetry, I think your book says that they were just mad for poetry, right? They were just kind of crazy about it. Um, it is the, the uh, top of all the genres. Um, in this next bullet point, we're going to see that uh, one thing that the Romantics brought was this new sense of power and agency of poetry, and especially of the poet. As someone who was able to enact social, political, historical change uh, with their writings, um, Shelley said in the defense of poetry that poets are the unacknowledged legislators of the world, right? That they're the ones, right? And this kind of harkens back to Plato's idea of the philosopher king, that the person who is most suited to be the leader of a society is someone who has studied philosophy because they understand the truths of the world and ethics. Um, the Romantics are kind of saying the same thing, that poets are the ones who can see the truth in nature, that they have a special ability to pierce through the veil, uh, Shelley uses that imagery, to see, you know, the great truths of you know, the universe, and that their job, their responsibility is to articulate that in a way that shares that knowledge with other people. Right? And that is, that's a really big responsibility. And we really don't see that um, as something that's really articulated in other eras before this time. So this is one of the, the really interesting things. So with that, then poetry becomes, um, a means of social change. And so that means that poetry should matter. It should have a theme, it should have a point. And this is this sparks a discussion that we have still today. In fact, in the oh, late 19th, early 20th century, we have a movement called Art for Art's Sake. And this is a reaction against this idea of poetry and novels and, and all the, and fine art um, as having to have some kind of social message, right? That it's just art because it's art, right? Um, and, and we still, you know, are arguing, should art have meaning or should it just be what it is, right? Um, there's also a new sense of self-reference in, in romantic poetry that is, again, unusual. Um, you know, Byron, you know, encouraged people to equate his main characters like Manfred and Don Juan. Yes, I said Don Juan. That's the way we say it in English literature, not Don Juan, uh, with himself, right? That somehow the adventures of Child Harold uh, are actually, you know, things that Byron went through in his own life, right? Um, Wordsworth, you know, liked to, you know, write about ways that really showed his internal spiritual journey, right? right? So, Poetry is almost confessional. There is a brand of confessional poetry, but it's usually much more direct. Oftentimes, the um, the romantics are being a little bit more indirect or implied, though there are some poems that are quite, you know, they just open themselves up and let you see what they think and what they feel, right? This is um, a difference in poetry. They're not writing about historical figures. They're not writing about kings and king and queens and other people. Well, that that doesn't mean that they don't have those subjects, but 
the idea that you could write about more than that, that you could write about just stuff that happens to you and how you feel about it, right? Uh, this is one of the things that romantic poetry gives us. And I think, again, we can see uh, just how much that is still part of the way we think about writing, right? Um, and again, that's that next point that talks about the the emphasis, the focus on everyday life, humble life, plain style, that you don't have to, you know, gussy up your uh, poems with all sorts of fancy language that you can write in just a straightforward style. I think we really see this with Wordsworth. He's the best embodiment of this kind of poetry. Coleridge uh, likes more of that fantastical romance. And, you know, Byron, you know, really didn't embrace that. I don't think Shelley did either. Uh, you know, when he says, you know, hail to thee, blithe spirit, bird thou never wert in his uh, ode, to a, uh, ode to a skylark, that's not plain everyday style language. So you do have other poets. We're not going to read many of them. We're going to really read Wordsworth. Um, but, you know, the, the freedom to use language is is much more greater in this era, right? But we look at this era as, as short as it is, we still see what we call the first generation and the second generation. The first generation would be Wordsworth and Coleridge, Lee Hunt, uh, who we're not reading is another important figure there. Second generation is Byron, Shelley, and Keats. Those are our primary uh, writers. And we do see some big differences there. We see Byron and Keats especially kind of look at Wordsworth and kind of see, see him as a doddering old man. Wordsworth lived a really long time, right? Uh, Shelley is a little bit more respectful, I think. But Byron and Keats both, you know, don't think too much about Wordsworth. Uh, I think they did have a regard for Coleridge, uh, perhaps not only because Coleridge was writing things much more what they were doing, especially Keats, but Coleridge also had a really important literary critical career. Um, his Biographia Literaria, which we will read one of them for, um, his commentary on Shakespeare, we still read those in my field today. So he had kind of a literary uh, reputation, whereas Wordsworth, I don't remember what he did, but he quit his job to be a poet, right? Uh, and then ended up working as a postman, like he was a, the, the, the post officer or whatever, uh, you know, as for his pension. Uh, so again, realize that there are a lot of things going on here, and we can't say that this is what all romantics stood for. Uh, we can just say these are some of the things that we're going to see in romantic literature. Um, finally, in terms of characteristic romantic literature, uh, is the idea the isolated, often alienated individual? Um, he, um, you know, standing up against everyone else, or he's out there by himself, and it's by this isolation that he's allowed to really contemplate and reflect on who he is and discover his true spiritual side, right? Excuse me again. <coughs> this is a, a much more common hero. We also see the first anti heroes uh, in this era. You know, heroes are no longer, you know, white hat, villains are black hat. Now all of a sudden we see guys that have gray hats, right? They have issues. They're not perfect. They're not, you know, all pure and all of that, right? Now, I can think of plenty of literature that happened before this era where I look at it like Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. I'm thinking, well, well, he isn't perfect. But what we mean by an anti-hero is that he's actually doing things that really aren't considered heroic, right? Uh, Batman is a really good example of an anti-hero. Batman is obsessed. He has got serious trauma, and he's quite violent. Um, and, you know, so he's not like Superman, who is our ideal hero, right? Uh, unless he's under the influence of red kryptonite, right? But with Batman, we have a guy who will compromise. Um, he will sometimes take shortcuts to get to get justice or sometimes revenge, right? And so that's what we mean by anti-hero. They're not going to always choose the most cleanest, purest, uh, you know, method. It's not always justice. Sometimes it might also be revenge. And so we see the first ones kind of cropping up. And that makes sense, right? Because these these poets are kind of revolting against everything that had come before that, that was so prescriptive about how you should be as a poet, right? Um, this one that there is uh, with the rise of industry, 
Um, we also see this affecting literature, and so new methods of printing and, and distribution make it a lot easier and faster to get into print. And this is causing problems. There, there are some dire warnings about how this will destabilize and devalue a literature because like anybody can get published, right? And so this is an issue, uh, the issue of overproduction. Uh, but again, more people are literate. Uh, literacy is growing rapidly at this time. And so there's a great demand for printed work. And so we see uh, those things changing. Um, okay, writing in the marketplace in the law courts. Um, like I said, we see more and more people, especially in the lower middle class who are now literate. Um, and I think eventually that's gonna translate into the Victorian era as the, the rise of prose and kind of the downfall of poetry. That as more lower and middle class people become literate, they are more likely to want to read prose. They're wanting to read articles, newspapers, magazine articles, and novels, right? Things that sound and look like everyday life or that they can understand. Poetry becomes something, um, and, and we're going to see, the, the, I think, the height of this with T.S. Eliot in the 20th century. Poetry becomes more and more elite, that you need to have uh, an advanced education, a rich, you know, humanities base for you to be able to read and understand some of these poems, right? And so I think that's why we see the downfall of poetry, because poetry is just harder to read because it's condensed, right? It's about giving you an impression as opposed to giving you all the details, right? So as I think literacy rates increase, for lower classes, this is why we see a shift to more prose-based works, though we still have lots of lots of great poetry that's being written. Um, and okay, I think I talked about all this. And again, on that last point there, um, rather than having strict laws and the censorship that would have been part of the past, uh, now charging the threat of charging authors with uh, what it says, sedition or blasphemy, was one way of controlling. And they also had a lot of ta taxes on printed, uh, printed matter that would also be an imp, um, you know, something that uh, made it harder to get works out, right? Uh, this next last period talks about other literary forms. We're primarily going to look at poetry, though there is a significant amount of pamphleteering and essay writing going on. Um, and there are uh, novels being written uh, and there are plays being written. Um, but we don't really see a whole lot of novels coming out of this period. Um, there's something called Caleb Williams by William Godwin that is often read. Uh, and drama. Uh, most of the drama at this time is just basically that that's being performed are basically things that have been written in previous eras. Um, the drama that we see being written by our major poets like Byron and Shelley are what we call closet drama. And that's drama that's meant to be read and not performed. Uh, that's because they would add all these fantastical elements that there was just no way to produce them on stage at the time. Uh, Manfred is a good example of this by Byron. However, we do see these things being produced in the more modern era because now we have the technical know-how to, to do incredible things. If you've ever seen Phantom of the Opera, you know, it's like, oh my gosh, that looks like a real lake, right? Um, or real river that he's, that he's rowing on, right? Because of that, we see more of these things being um, performed. Um, and, and Shelley did have some work like the Chen Chi that was performed, but again, most of the time it's just, it's really meant to be read. Uh, so we don't have a whole lot of drama that we study in this era, uh, unless you're in a romantic, po uh, romantic period class, that's all you're doing, then you will study some, but it's not one of the main, um, you know, things. Uh, it's not until the Victorian era that we start seeing a rise in, um, uh, comedy with uh, Oscar Wilde especially, and that is the one play that we'll read. Um, I believe that's the only play we'll read this semester, and that is Oscar Wilde's Importance of Being Earnest. Um, the professional literary crit critic uh, is, um, you know, now coming into his own uh, writing uh, criticism of works in a way that shapes society, and some of these things are just really mean-spirited um, and you'll see poets have feuds with them right and and you know sometimes they'll write a poem in response that lampoons you know a, a, a magazine or a person who uh, criticized their work right um, and again it says in the last thing is that the novel is going to grow as more and more importance as we go through the period um, 
and again, but we're going to see a lot more experimentation with those forms. Uh, I don't think we're reading a novel in the romantic period. I think the first novel we read is uh, maybe Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Is that the one? We'll read, I think, two novels. Uh, well, uh, Heart of Darkness is a novella. It's only about 30 pages long, uh, but uh, we will read a couple of things. Uh, I, I wish we could read something from Jane Eyre and Frankenstein and Dracula and uh, maybe Sense and Sensibility or something from Jane Austen, but those things are not provided to us in this book. So, um, you know, we make do with what we can. So, um, I hope you enjoyed this discussion of this romantic period. Start looking at the romantic writers. Look for those uh, different kind of uh, characteristics of the romantic era. And again, do reading. You don't have to just base on what's in our book. Go out and look on Spark Notes or uh, all sorts of different places where you can find really interesting insights about uh, different authors, specific poems, or the romantic era. And that's how you uh, increase your knowledge. So uh, I will see you next time with the discussion of Blake. Bye-bye.